It's July the 27th, 2024. I'm Chris, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. And we're back. The three of us. Yay! Yay. Band is back together again. Ah. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. It feels like it's been many, many weeks since there was all the three of us together. But I know that's partly been my fault, right? (laughs) Because I've been away and stuff. (laughs) Summer. We call it summer. Oh, but being good. I mean, we we made made episodes. We missed you. We Just the usual. (laughs) Just the you. That's all right. That's good to know that yeah that that we have a consistent service for our listeners, yes. and viewers. All right. Um, so let's see how where to. Well, if everyone will have read the title anyway, so we'll talk Canon today, and especially the AI thing. I know. Yeah, this is, I thought it's a rare that, opportunity that we have to discuss comp- though. Not, not Canon specifically, but you know, uh, you know, call back when when um, the drinking game here was AI. Every <laughs> we are. well, that's so, one of the things that caught my eye because it's a chance to actually talk about cameras and AI at the same time, right? Well, yep. yeah, and interesting when we when we discussed like where do you think this is going? What is the future of photography? And I, I remember we had a lot of conversations about the integration of AI processing, etc., within cameras to be able to do what it is you need to do. And Canon is pretty much first out of the gate with a, I would say, a robust uh, application. Uh, Just the very beginnings of this. Adrian, you want to describe what you see? Well, yeah, absolutely. And you know what, just just as a a scene setting thing, you're my establishing shot here, right, is that, you know, this, just the last two months or so, that I feel the conversation around AI is starting to turn now, not from AI for the sake of AI and isn't it marvellous and what could it do, which has all been great, but it's changing now to actual what I would call production quality implementations of AI. So we've got Apple intelligence just about to hit us in a few months' time, uh, not out in any of the betas yet. And, Unless and you are in the EU, then a lot of that will not come because of some regulations, but... Is that right? Is that yes. right? I didn't know. I hadn't heard that. <laughs> I wonder if that'll affect Britain then, because of course we're not in the EU anymore, but <laughs> we still have a lot of European laws. But the, yeah, but the, the 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 thing I feel, and it feels, it feels like the a really good maturity step we're starting to take with AI now, which is the productionization, the production quality versions of AI that are actually serving a use case right so so, yeah we've all no doubt heard about apple intelligence so i won't go over that but the that's one of the things that caught my eye about the canon announcements uh, of new cameras uh, that have just come out so this is the canon eos r3 uh, which is the 45 megapixel do everything uh you know camera it does super high resolution video at high frame rates it does really good quality photography etc 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 so it's the the all-rounder and and really interesting as well which we should talk about just as a sideline is that they they're actually launching three separate hand grips for it Um, one of which is a normal one um which just more batteries and vertical controls uh one of which is a cooling fan for if you got it you know for video which uh, i think it is fantastic and i forget what the third one does but it's something quite interesting as oh it's got an ethernet port in it the I network think. So one it's, yeah. It's, yeah it's the network network port one uh so that's really interesting so really good all-round camera system can do everything and then there's the sports one um, um what do you know they announce it just as the olympics start um they didn't ship it for months and months and months yet. And it's often in the past that Canon and Nikon have brought out their new flagship, you know, sports cameras just ahead of a big sporting event like the Summer Olympics, which are just starting. Um, but the uh, but nonetheless, right, although it's not real yet, um, it looks really promising. And they've embedded, this is the things they've got me, they've embedded proper production quality AI in these cameras so let's with, uh, there's there's two or three bits but we'll talk okay. about it. sorry chris go ahead i'm, I'm just i'm just saying proper uh, production quality ai with a very limited scope that's kind of the 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 secret behind it it's not all purpose whatever it is very focused on one single task and tries to do that really well 
For those yeah. of us uh, who've who've kind of used um, and abused Gigapixel or Magnifique or um, AI already, I mean, there's there's several upscalers that are quite good. Each one providing somewhat of a different uh, output, but but you know um, you know you, you could take a 700k image and blow it up to 4K, and uh, it looks pretty good. Um, so that kind of software has been available on one's computer and, in fact, on one's phone um, as an outboard ap application to kind of enhance. Once you get the same kind of thing going, I mean, imagine a gigapixel type thing, this probably promises to end the race of... Uh, more and more megapixel chips and and uh, you know there'll be a balance to cameras coming out which is like find the kind of sweet spot maybe it's 45 megapixels maybe it's 60 I don't know what it is and then to allow the upscaler to do a lot of robust uh, again interpretation of those pixels on the go uh, and we're not talking about a, adding a tree, taking away a tree, those kinds of things, which I think are coming right on the heels of this kind of stuff, where you take a picture and you go like, make everybody smile, you know, open everybody's <laughs> eyes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. remove the tree growing out of, you know, uh, my wife's head. Uh, th those kinds of things I think are, are, are coming, especially um, uh, the kind of I guess the the chip, the processing power of these um, software elements can be fit into a camera and and used pretty effectively. But I think the the race to the megapixel uh, end is is about to end. I mean, I think I think we're going to see a stop there, and much more leaning. And this is a guess, not anything that I know, but it's a why bother spending massive amounts of money on chip manufacturing where you can do it with software just as effectively and really determine what the end game is and go back into your images in your camera and basically go, you know, I really, I really need a billboard quality yeah. size here. Let me just output it that way. And when your uh, network um, connected, uh, you don't even have to store it on your phone. Uh, on your uh, uh -huh. Cat on your camera, yeah. <laughs> on your camera, it's it's. This is one of the interesting things. So, what you're referring to there, of course, is that um, uh, neither of these cameras have uh, a, a a multi shot. You know, move the sensor slightly hardware based way of creating high resolution yeah images, uh, and the 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 R one with its meager twenty four megapixels. Um, one could argue that there was an impossibly small number of pixels. Although, of course, yeah, you know, for 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 its intended purposes, it's it's typically more than. That's a very specialized camera. It right? is a very specialized camera. But what? Well, yes, but but the the fact that they've now built AI based image enlargement in at the software yes. level i suppose you could, you could call it firmware i guess couldn't you because it's a camera so it, yeah but you know and software as we know is much cheaper to produce than hardware as jeremiah as you've just said just now right that you know why go to all of that effort and, and challenge and expense to create tiny little motors and gyroscopes and, and sensors that move around and stuff like that if you can implement something just as good uh, algorithmically in software and, and not only that yeah. it, it's self-improving because if if this uh if if it works the more the you know i suspect there'll be some kind of of uh, opt-in, which enables Canon themselves to kind of analyze how your pixels are being upresed and used, um, how that works, that would, uh, even that in a depersonalized way, that so that they'll be able, could. yeah, to to improve it along the way. And and um, I, I I think that the the future of that kind of photography bodes really well because. You, do you need a large, um, you know, bokeh-friendly uh, chipset where a very small one, and we can look at the iPhone, we can look at a small miniature camera to produce, you know, the equivalent bokeh, the equivalent of 
uh, sharpness, the equivalent of um, massive blow-ups. I find it very, <clears throat> very interesting to see how people's or photographers' like stands um, on on that changed over the years because I remember when when we had the early days of of upresing. AI upresing, which mean which means inventing pixels, which means making new pixels that are not there, um, which also means changing things like the wing of a butterfly. Um, if you microscopically check that, the one that was upresed is not gonna be identical um, to the one that was shot with a better macro lens. So it, the, the, there is there the, the information in the picture changes, and initially um, the the response to that was quite negative from photographers. No, I want my pixels. And uh, and over time, that has completely changed, as if it doesn't matter anymore, um, which in many cases probably doesn't. But um, photographers have, have like come around to, yeah, sure, why not? Upraising well, they, uh, is a they, thing. There's an alternative uh, argument to that, which is it just keeps getting more accurate. So... You know, the the quality of interpreting the pixel information and its adjoining pixel, which is really how it is going to decide how to shape that or, or, or color it or sharpen it, I think gets more and more and more accurate. And it gets more accurate the more images are produced under that system so that... Um, if you have the colors of that butterfly wing shift radically or, or the design radically and there's some feedback, even in the lab without, and then that starts to get, well, why is that happening? Um, and then the, the kind of adjustment phase becomes more and more accurate. Just the same way yeah. that when you use mid-journey and you add an accuracy weight or a heavily stylized or even weird weight number, it, it'll fly off. So sometimes you really want that butterfly wing to be radically different or the tree to, to have snow on it or the snow to be removed on it or the sun to, you know, be on the beach where you're in the, you know, Cornwall rain or whatever, however you're going, you're going to um, take your family holiday. Um, that may be up to the shooter. And um, uh, so I, I think that all of what we're really saying is these, these things are available in software um, on your computer. I mean, uh, I know I've been using it. I think Chris has been using it. And, you know, we, we try to stay abreast of this. But, but when it's integrated into a camera that's in your bag, that's pretty great and of course it will the next jump is of course into your phone which is what oh, most yeah people use. absolutely and as you say these things are going to get better over time i mean this of course is the nature of machine learning right mm -hmm. the model learns from from you know from its outputs now i haven't read just to be clear i haven't read anything that suggests that the machine learning is taking place on an individual camera unit jeremiah as you suggest there's no doubt got to be some level of harvesting of images and and back to the lab to try it on the big systems which uh, which, but I which, forward. which makes <laughs> it hard because these cameras the 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 connectivity of these cameras is notoriously difficult how they collect the training data is going to be a really interesting one yes. maybe maybe they'll get it from Flickr. i don't know but, oh, the, but <laughs> just just but, to interrupt for a second it may not be the images themselves they may uh, just be able to send the math over in other words just a basically the 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 numbers of how it could, how it it could be it could be that code, but, but how, how the code works so i think as a user though so so the, there's definitely some of that you know model re, model training and refining that that is a, a workflow to work out i guess which is a canon but that's a canon problem not an adrian problem or a jeremiah problem or a chris problem the benefit to us though as users is when you get regular firmware updates with those machine learning models updated with new training data mm. a bit like when you get a new gpt right at the yeah our gpt 4.0 is out now brilliant it's better than 3.5 turbo awesome right there is that kind of thing when that starts coming you know down down i was gonna say down the pipeline over the airways however you do it to your camera and we start getting in you know improvements that's that's a really powerful thing 
That's a really powerful thing. Also, right. it could be up to the individual. Like, for example, um, if I was using one of those cameras and I felt that, you know, maybe it's 75% of the way there, but I, if I just check this box um, and allow the kind of interactivity of Canon to read my images or, um, or the metadata associated with it, that I can see a real improvement. So it may just improve my camera and my Ooh. photography. I'm I'm pay to play, I like it. <laughs> the thing I'm a bit worried about is that um, depending on what type of highly sensitive things you're shooting, <laughs> well, you might yes, not be sir. aware of that. So an opt-in is absolutely necessary. Yeah. Have you heard what, what X.com X just did? They enabled um, all profiles. If you have an X.com X profile, check... Um, if they, well, they, they will have enabled um, a checkbox in your profile to allow all your stuff to be used to train their AI, their Grok AI. Oh, okay. So, yes. <laughs> so you can do it this or that. But data is, data is, of course, the secret in making this good and making this better. So they are doing everything. Um, and even Canon will do everything to get data to train things on, of course. I think yes. we're, you know, we're heading, and this is kind of a sidebar about training, harvesting, etc. But I think we are seeing the beginnings of the problems associated with harvesting um, data that's created by AI. <laughs> and so they're well, running there is out that, yeah. of things to harvest. Um, yes. entire discussion on synthetic data for training Correct. and so on. Um, that is a bit of a rabbit hole. I would like to also talk about the AI autofocus that, um, mm. sure. let's do that. Yes. Is, is doing something new to, as far as I know, which is that for, I think just three ball sports right now, soccer, basketball, volleyball, I believe, they have a lot of uh, information now or trained a new model that knows these sports a bit better, as in when does a soccer player pass a ball to another player and then model their autofocus based on that, as in you kick the ball to another player and the focus goes to the other player before the ball is even there. So um, That sounds interest quite intriguing. Interesting that they only have three sports, though, that they officially support for this specific... I would imagine mode. training training this is a massive logistical um, not problem, but but it just the the amount it's of data. Yeah, of, yeah it's it, it, it's massive, and so to go through every rule and how passes are legal and not legal, how when to do it, how it works, what plays would a fake pass, what you know, all of these things have to be integrated. Um, but just sort of in a general way. Um, just having AI take a sharp photo. In other words, if you sort of like turn on autofocus or off photo, so you manual focus, turn on autofocus, it'll do a good job. But if you check another box, which is AI focus, um, and assign it to your eye, anywhere you look is going to be sharp. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to wait for the AI or the autofocus to determine, oh, this is the area I want to focus in, or this is where the square in my frame is, it'll just know. Um, on the other hand, it may just go, I'll put everything in focus and then allow you to kind of defocus as to your taste. These are things not only in the, the kind of pixel uh, interpretation um, in terms of getting things bigger, but also sharper. And how much sharpness is aesthetically pleasing? Because we all know um, you can over sharpen something so it just looks weird and liney and illustrative rather than photographic. So there's a few bits and bobs in there, isn't there? Because uh, and it relates to several of the bits of functionality that come through the cameras. So, so Chris, I mean, your your thing about the the sports stuff, I think. You know, I think that could be really useful. I, 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 I spent a little bit of time trying to think through what kind of image 
would that be relevant on? Because if you if you think about your really close crop uh, uh, of a of an athlete, you know the sort of thing that makes the front page of the newspaper, you know the 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 soccer player striking for goal, that kind of thing. Though uh, I, I'm, there's not often a lot of movement between players because the whole point there is to isolate the individual, right? In that shot, then you've got your super wide establishing shots, which you know, uh, which, which depending on what sport. Yeah, there could be 22 players on the pitch right <laughs> so they're all the, they're all going to be fairly little stick men and women um uh, and and the ball will be a little dot so uh, uh, and so to get all of that in you've got to have a fairly wide angle and you've got to be fair distance away which means a lot of stuff is going to be in focus already so i'm struggling a little bit to think about what is the the the, the sweet spot where that kind of capability becomes really really powerful i'm sure i'm sure there is one and maybe it's just because uh i don't know volleyball very well for example well, you yeah. know talking about but, soccer i mean uh, many years ago i i had a gig i i was a photographer for the olympics and i remember uh covering soccer um you know which you do generally with a longer lens and you're on the sidelines and Again, it, it's just your understanding of the game and where the ball might be and that, you know, to, to swivel and maneuver. I mean, your brain, your body is all kind of working together. The amount of, of kind of synapse firing in your head to be able to get that perfect moment is significant. And so if you just kind of move that over to artificial intelligence, there's a lot that has to be It'll analyzed. It'll speed up things for you. Um, mm. especially with shots where you would typically take the same type of shot and the same decisions, um, as long as you can turn it off. I mean, that's, again, yeah. the most important thing because I might want to do an artsy shot where the focus is, sure. I don't know, on the goal in the in the background or something. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah and, 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 and kind of kind of moving that into, say, street photography. You know, you know, you put on a 21 millimeter lens you know, you're down the street, you're not looking through the lens, you're firing at random and whatnot, and you know a couple of things. Every shot's going to be in focus. You're going to be able to determine what is in focus. Even your barrel distortions are going to be able to be corrected because of the extreme wide. Uh, you don't have to worry about kind of repositioning or uh, re, you know, blowing up a certain portion of that street photograph and having it sharp and, and um, you know, and then, you know, if you want to emulate a film style or grain or color uh, or contrast, that's all available to it. So I, I, I can see with AI, you're going to have a whole generation of amazing street photographers being able to shoot amazing pictures at, without the, uh, without the, I guess, call it the luck value, because if you're shooting street, and that's not something that I do, but I have, um, there's a lot of luck and anticipation of, you know, someone about to cross the street or walk into a shadow or out of the shadow. Sure. Th those kinds of things. So you're anticipating. Um, when, when your anticipation can be larger, you have more options later or even in camera to go, you know, I... I, I can see the day where you want to have your camera programmed for a very specific aesthetic, which is I'm shooting from a, you know, chiaroscuro from a deep shadow into a highlight. And I want very much to capture the moment they emerge and have the, the, the trigger fire exactly at the right moment. Those are things so that's, that I think. That's an interesting scenario because, and, and you're kind of doing naturally what I started to do as well, which is to stitch together these new capabilities in the cameras and think, well, what could I do? Um, and I think I saw at some point, I think I saw a YouTuber say, actually, you know, so some stuff about this, the, the, uh, the subject detection and tracking is it helped as well. But the, uh, the, there is of course in these cameras, the, the eye, fo eye control focus technology, which is where the, the, the camera looks at where you're, where in the frame you're looking in the view, in the viewfinder, um, where are you, where is your eye focusing on and therefore making the, the focus point move to that spot. Now that's great for a bit but of course if you're checking the corners of your yeah. composition and stuff like that then your focus point is jumping all over the place so but what you could do now is actually the the new part of the new ai subject detection in these cameras is designed to work with that eye control 
technology. So you say, okay, I'm going to look at the thing I want to, the, the subject, and let's say it's a person walking through a scene. Maybe it is a street photography thing. Um, but then the AI it says, okay, that's my subject. I'm just going to track that subject now. So it stops looking at what your eye's doing and because it, it's locked on, if you like, and, and it's going to track the subject. And apparently it can even do that if somebody else walks in front of them and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's it's supposed to be you know, a pretty powerful way of, of subject tracking. It'll do people, of course, um, and nowadays they do animals and, and vehicles as well. So yeah, there's, there's quite a lot going on there. So yeah, yeah, I mean, imagine there's a, you know, if you're, uh, if you're in photographing motor racing for example and they all come around the first corner in a bunch you look at one particular car the the, the ca camera locks on and you can track it all the way around the next corner yeah and stuff like that Here, these, here's these an things could be quite powerful here's an interesting one another feature that i just remembered they they have is um that you can register people's faces and prioritize them for focusing. So you could, let's say you're shooting a wedding and you want the bride and groom, if they're in the photo, they are in, in focus. And then you have some lesser important people that should also be like in focus if they're in a crowd and it'll pick them out. It's only good for like 10 people at a time. I think you can have 10 sets of 10 people. So, but if you know what you're shooting, let's say, I don't know, a party, a, a a, a, a poli pol political rally or something, then you have certain key figures that need to be um, in focus. Yeah, and it's good. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have a special category for the mother of the bride, though. You don't want to get exactly, out of that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then combine all these things, and you're right. It's pretty, it's, it's opening up pretty interesting, or oh, yeah. let's say it's creating interesting shortcuts and it's taking cognitive load off of you the photographer same as the i don't know driving assistance features that are on the market and that kind of stuff it's making the whole thing smoother for you and you will probably return from that job with less of a headache and, and that's, so that's a really good point to make because possibly, that, you know, a, possibly, a lot of these yeah. things are aimed at professionals and i think you know the, the there is two elements to it, and I think this is where Jeremiah was going to go as well, which is, of course, that none of this is a substitute for knowing what to point your camera at and when, right? You know, uh, so so there, there is still obviously the, the art and the craft of photography to go with it, but maybe it increases your hit rate or your keeper rate or something like that. Because you know, yeah. I can imagine you, you might, you know, there, there could be, let's go back to the sports thing again. Let's say you've only got the 200 mil lens on and you should have the 400 mil lens on. But the ability to track a subject for, that's smaller in the frame from further away, get a sharp photograph on that subject, automatically upscale it using the AI-based algorithm in the camera, send it down the Ethernet cable to the agency, all in 20 seconds, right? Yeah, I mean, I think... You should, you should think work you... for Canon. That was a perfect, <laughs> like, a perfect uh, uh, usage of all those features in one go. <laughs> you know, for me, I, I, I look at this and... Um, I, I think if I put on my professional photographer hat, I think, yeah, this is a this is a tool that I could really, really use as as a professional photographer, whether it's fashion, sports, advertising, generally, you know, even food photography, where you want, you know, one sesame seed and the smoke kind of rise. Like, there are real, uh, you know, use cases where your client is there if you're tethered. And I, I can see that. Personally, um, my relationship with, photo with photography is the opposite. <laughs> I mean, I use a camera which has the least amount of stuff yeah, yeah. in it. I all I want is the ability to change the aperture and the shutter speed. But you're That's also not a, you're also not a volleyball photographer, you know. No, I'm I, yeah. I'm not. So you know, my relationship with the camera is, I want to be able to control a few things and just you know really focus my attention on the world around me and not have the camera interfere or supplement uh with that process however as you guys know and our listeners viewers know i'm obsessed with ai and use it constantly but i do so not as um a photographer but more as an artist as a tool to kind of create imagery but but with 
photography, I'm much more of a purist, even though my instinct is more black and white, I would say. Um, you know, um, I think that that it really, I really like the idea of cameras that are robust enough to be able to turn this stuff on and off at will. And those use cases professionally can be really, really helpful to a professional who needs to deliver a certain kind of image expected by the client on a certain date. It, it, it's the way when we used to shoot and, we, you know, you shot a lot of film and then, like, you got it back from the lab and you would go like, oh, thank goodness, that's the <laughs> shot. Like, why, you know, like, there is that, like, breath-holding moment, no matter how <laughs> good you are, no matter how experienced you are, there's that gap, which is also a very exciting gap, you know, almost like the moment on the roller coaster where you're going over the top and... You know what I mean? So that's exciting as well as a little bit, you know, scary. And um, for cinema, I think it's also going to have great applications. Mm. Yeah, there are there are sides of photography that are completely not photography related. Absolutely. So anyway, so really exciting cameras, I think. Um, and I don't normally say that about you know top of the range professional camera announcements but this really starts for me to turn a corner um into you know a ai specific you know as you say chris narrow scope ai but something that is really effective and very much but in combination right case. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely so so some really good stuff but definitely stuff to watch here very cool all right i'll be ready for some pics yeah let me see, which one do I take first? Um, Jeremiah, you're first today. Um, yes. Let the world tell your story. Google Earth Studio, what does it do? This is something that I've just started to scratch the surface on, but it enables you to create all kinds of flyovers, um, movements, you know, MP4s. Oh, this, looks like, this looks like a video editor. It, it, it effectively is, you can set a lot of parameters. I'm not pretending in any way to be uh, an experienced user. I've just gotten into this, but uh, it's, it seems very exciting uh, using Google Earth. I think these are all synthetic views too. Yeah, they, they, they do have a lot of, uh, a lot of building information and a lot of the 3D stuff that you get uh, on close-up. Isn't there? So that means all our vacation videos are going to change dramatically when we have mm. all the flyovers and the, and the, you know, you remember, remember when, when you did uh, these kind of things and you had the map and it went yeah. like a red line from A to B and a little airplane to show you from which, which path you traveled. That'll, that's a thing of the past now. Probably. Yeah, and and Indiana Jones. Worth, that that was one of the main segues in all the Indiana Jones movies. True. That little that animation. True. But but uh, with with the studio, I think it provides a set of tools. For example, if you were making a little video on New York City, you know, you could start it with a flyover and move through the buildings, and then zoom out or zoom in um, at will. And just output it and use it. And I, I think But not of the Eiffel Tower and not of or at least not of the Eiffel Tower at night. Not when it's of lit the up. The Empire yeah. State Building. Not of because of all There is all a bit of, of a dystopian component there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, 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 what, what do they do then? Do they do some sort of yeah, they do they like put different blocks where the buildings have got copyrights of their own imagery and you're not allowed to use well, it. Well, no, you maybe you can pay. shoot it's it, like... but you can't use it. I, I you know, who, yeah, who yeah. knows? I mean, you know, anyone can take pictures. There's so of many me. questions behind yeah. that. So many. But yeah. it's all good fun. We'll leave it to the okay. lawyers. Right. Um, I brought us, I brought us something AI yeah, related. So, and, and space related, which is another thing that I'm quite into. Um, and that is how to spot AI fakes. Now, scientists have, have found out that you can use galaxy measurement tools to spot AI fakes, as in fakes of people, right? Okay. 
So what they do is they, they, I don't know exactly how it works, but what they do is um, they can tell from the reflections in the eyes, the catch lights, using these galaxy measuring tools, probably because they measure galaxies from different angles, depending on where the Earth is. And uh, that's apparently one thing that AI still isn't good at, making real, physically correct um, catch lights. So and That's interesting you say that. Uh, whenever uh, somebody asks me, uh, is this real or not, and it's a human face, the first thing I do is I zoom into the iris, mm -hmm. and you can really see it. I mean, you don't need galaxy and, and <laughs> And of course, I, I I have I admit I have in the past uh, and every now and then faked uh, a catch light because it yeah. just didn't look right in the photo, so I had sure. to clone one from the other eye over. Um, yeah, and there's a technique to do that to just exactly to copy, you know to still flip and and do that uh, exactly. I've, I've done on my uh, I've done that <laughs> several times on on my clown our dark shots. secrets yeah but but um i i think the eye gets but used to be hands but they've gotten much better at hands now yeah so the um, the cash lights are the are the next frontier apparently when it comes to the forensic analysis of ai photos yeah so probably in two weeks time yeah, probably we'll <laughs> probably all right last but not least adrian you brought us a french website I did, and particularly a, a French website because this is the, the, the publisher or the editor of a particular project. If you click where it says voir on the left-hand side here, uh, you'll see some amazing photos. So you may be aware that uh, back in, I think, 2017, uh, the project was started called the Anonymous Project, which collected codachromes. Um, yeah, an anonymous codachromes, pick them up from markets and stuff like that. And apparently has a library now of over a million codachrome slides. Wow. And this was all started by a chap, uh, oh, I've, I've lost his name, Shulman, I think, um, somebody Shulman. Um, he has collaborated with, with an artist called Omar Victor Diop, um, who is a self-portrait artist. Because one of the things they noticed when they they had all of these codachromes, and a lot of these are family snapshots over the ages, yeah, and travel holidays, is that often the photographer got up out of a chair to take the photo of everybody else so in a lot of these photos they've collected there's an empty chair right and this project it inserts uh the the artist uh who happens to be african uh into these photos and the african thing is important because a lot of these photos are yeah, 50 60 70s very much uh white american people at least that's the subset of the their collection that they've chosen so what they've done is in their ways they've it, slightly tongue-in-cheek but with an important message behind it they've rewritten history or they've offered an alternative history because they, they, they have photoshopped a, a black man into all of these middle-class american <laughs> this white is amazing scenarios. this is really good <laughs> This is and sometimes, sometimes you have to work. Sometimes you have to work hard to spot him. Like the one that Christy showed at the graduation ceremony. I mean, you imagine a graduation ceremony at an Ivy League college in the 1960s. There, there were very, very rarely would there be anybody you know, uh, of color, anybody non-white. Um, and so to to insert somebody in there, and and if you um, you can read about it, I'll, I'll try and um, I read about this first in the magazine, but uh, there's an interview on YouTube which I will add into the show notes as well, which talks about how they did it. They had a whole set of vintage clothes from a a, a wardrobe, a professional wardrobe, you know, in in Paris. All of this was shot in Paris. They shot on a grey screen. They had to work really really hard to make sure that the lighting, because all of these were shot in a studio, so. Uh, like that, like the, the artist make... himself inserting him, himself into these shots that are definitely not studio shots. Yeah. So. No, that, that are definitely not. Most many of them are shot outside because they're people's holiday snapshots, right? Yeah. Um, and and he's also a very good actor, and he you know, the way he interacts with the people in these photos is is quite humorous. So they've deliberately taken a humorous approach. They've deliberately taken an uh, yeah. It, it, it there is a statement here about you know, racial equality in society, although they were they were very. Um, 
precise to say that this is not that there is any way a criticism of how, of the people involved who, who are completely anonymous and they have no idea what those people were like or what they thought or how they behaved you know so this is not a critique of the behavior of the people in the photos it's more of a statement that actually although we've made a lot of progress we're still not there today right we still don't have proper equality in the world today um and so you know some of this uh you know wearing proper vintage clothes of the year even finding things like vintage beer bottles to you know and stuff like that to, as prop to use as props this but uh, lots and lots of fun uh, with, with the message behind it a, a, a wonderful photography project and you can buy the book should you choose to all right that is that's cool that's a very i just cool wanted find. you to know that during your rant, I you just ordered the it. Book. I just, <laughs> you just bought the book. Yeah, <laughs> this book is absolutely just rocks my world. Yeah. Uh, this is the kind of you call it ridiculous, call it artistic, brilliant, uh, socially relevant, uh, aesthetically amazing, completely original, and you know, just supremely inventive. What um, an idea, first of what all. What an idea. Right? So Omar good. Victor Diop. Amazing. Yes. And the Anonymous Project is it was a, a collaboration. Project. Yep. Yes. I you know it's funny because uh Diop, I, I you know I have a, a large collection of of um images, but but he's a, a, a Dakar photographer of note you know he's not he doesn't come out of nowhere and i i think somewhere in back here i have a a book of his of his stuff that is more portraiture and um pop color i mean you know stuff you have some of his work it, already do you i, I think, think so, he was but, uh, he was a new photographer to me when i when i saw this just to, for completeness um I, i've just looked it up in the background the, the guy who started the anonymous project is called lee shulman so so very much collaboration between lee shulman whose idea it was and his friend and colleague uh omar victor diop so fantastic so stuff fantastic, fantastic stuff. really great yeah. very cool awesome and is there any AI in there? I we, I don't know. We don't know. Uh, but we don't I think know. it's That's just your bog standard <laughs> traditional photoshopping. I think There's so a too, lot of yeah. skill in the a lot of skill in the lighting, the 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 angles of photography, choosing the right lenses. Um, there's a lot of skill in the the wardrobe, makeup, uh, and in the acting. Um, and then apparently the article I read when I first saw this said they had a really really good Photoshop editor and retoucher who, who managed to work it all in just so get the color grading right on the inserted shots conversations about how much film grain to add to match the rest of the shot all of that sort of stuff had to be worked through super super technical but very creative and artistic at the same time and and digitally uh emulating the kodachrome look isn't easy either right no. so no. I, it's something that i i personally have tried i've yeah. never Ever. They were quite right. Huh? It. It's I've got a Fuji and... recipe on my camera called Kodachrome, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll probably need AI for that. Anyway, I think that brings us to the end of this episode. Very happy um, to have both of you back. And this was this was a cool episode. AI in photography. Yeah, we haven't heard the last of that. We predicted this. We did predict this I, would yeah. happen. Go back. And sure enough. We so yeah, things our... things are happening. AI is doing its thing, um, and we'll see more of that. The question is, does Canon will they be able to overtake the smartphones in terms of features and so on? Well, That's the price point thing. is very and high. the price point. This, yeah. th this yeah. camera is what close to eight or right. nine thousand dollars, I think. Anyway, yeah, we yeah. mm. are at thefutureofphotography.com. Join our Discord and say hi next time you're around. We'll be back in a week from now. Until then, everyone, take care. Bye. Yeah. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Yeah.